the legislature has done anything within the last couple of years because I haven't seen or heard of any significant changes that are supposed to uh, keep teachers around or keep teachers incentivized to be here. We have dropped some of the protections that they get by being in the, um, I'm sorry, by, uh, by being protected. Uh, we have to make sure that teachers are held accountable, I'm sorry, to the same standards that a private uh, entity is. If teachers aren't performing well, they need to go. And I hate to say that, but that's true because uh, the way that we can guarantee that teachers stay is by, we first of all, we need to have resources to pay them well. But when we pay them well and we give them the standards to hold, we have to make sure they hold them up and we make sure that they are creating successful students. If they are not meeting our high standards, then they need to go. And the best way to do that is to pay them well and give them uh, a reason to want to be around, but yes, to make sure that they are held accountable and then if they are not uh, handling students well, if they're not getting the results that we have demanded that they get, then they must be revised and, and they need to be out on the, on the option of, of being fired or not. So I think our responsibility is to make sure that we have highly qualified teachers that are paid well and so they're not concerned about um, them, themselves, but also we need to make sure that they are held to the same high standard that we demand our students uh, achieve. And if they're not doing that, then we just need to be realistic and know that they can't stay forever. We, we need to be able to hold people accountable at every level, students, teachers, administrators, everyone's gotta be held accountable. So the best way to do that is to have good paying jobs, make sure our economy can sustain the uh, education fund that we create, and really we need to unleash our economy more by creating and correcting legislation that can put more money right back into education. Thank you. Thank you. How would you like to see the development of a school finance formula proceed? Please speak to some key elements of importance and whether or not the process for developing a new formula should be modified from this point forward. So this is going to be really hard work, right? We have to create a new school finance formula. The legislative bodies have to create a new school finance formula in the upcoming year that will have an impact for a really, really long time. And there are the, the well of money that we have to pull from is very small. But hopefully there will be new tax policies and we will change that in the future. But for now, there's a really tough job. And my understanding of how the world works involves when you have a really tough job, you get really smart people together around the table and you involve all of your stakeholders and you get your community on board and you talk to as many people as you can. So what the Kansas Association for School Boards, the Kansas Department of Education, and the United School, it's USA, United School Attend Super Attendance. Superintendents Association, thank you. They've come together to create a toolkit that's available online for communities to come together and create a response to the governor's call for um, input on the school finance planning. Shawnee Mission has done something on their website where they have a, a two-question uh, survey that they've sent out. I don't think that's enough. I think that we need to really engage in hard conversations with everybody who's in, who is a stakeholder. And that really means everybody. That's business leaders because the quality of schools affects them. It's students because they go to the schools. It's parents. It's taxpayers. Everybody needs to be in on this conversation. And we have resources to create those conversations. They need to happen and then they need to inform the process. And the process, the question also asked about key elements, the process has to address both our short-term issues, which are massive, and our long-term vision for making Kansas a leader in public education for the long term. Thanks. Thank you. Kansas school districts carry fund balances from year to year. In your opinion, is this an indication of excess funding or of responsible budgeting? Please explain and indicate whether you would recommend that district fund balances be swept into the state general fund or remain under the control of local school districts. Thank you. I think that many of our school districts do carry ending balances because they have practiced responsible budgeting. 
It is worth noting that the state of Kansas is currently at a point where our ending balance, as it is now, because as you all know, these things fluctuate and every month we get worse and worse news about our revenue projections. But right now, as it is, Kansas government can only function for two days. So, I think that you all know that the next answer to my question will be most emphatically that no, we should not sweep the money from responsible entities into our state general fund. I think that the state of Kansas sadly has proven that um, they really are not taking care of budgeting in a proper way. I think the schools are setting up a very good and very strong example. Now, it, it is also worth noting, of course, that I am a state legislator, but I have consistently fought against, spoken out against, and voted against many of those practices with which I am not pleased. And again, to speak to the optimism that I spoke with in my introduction, I think that we are going to see a new day in the state of Kansas starting that second Monday in January when we gavel in for session. You are going to see us start to pull ourselves out of that hole. And I think, again, we have wonderful examples that we've seen in Johnson County. Um, it's worth noting that the three cities that I represent, Overland Park, Leewood, and Prairie Village, are all AAA bond rated, as is the county of Johnson County, and I think Water District 1, so uh, just to throw that out there and give them some credit too. But we have wonderful examples for responsible budgeting right here in Johnson County, and I think that the Johnson County delegation has a wonderful opportunity to bring those examples to the state of Kansas. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to Senate District 7. Please describe your position regarding the use of public tax dollars for non-public schools in Kansas. Would you recommend keeping or repealing the tax credit scholarship program that was established in 2014 and expanded in 2015? Would you recommend keeping or repealing the tax credit scholarship program that was established in 2014 and expanded last year? No. <laughs> I have never supported public money going to private education. And it is very clear in our Constitution that public money cannot go into uh, theologic, church-based education programming. They, it cannot go there. And yet, we have had uh, legislation passed that allows for these special scholarships to go to those kinds of private schools. We need to rescind what we have put in place as far as the voucher program. I know there are uh, certain people still left that will be elected that think this is a positive thing. But my research that I have done in the past on both charter schools and voucher programs show that when you have failing school districts, that those programs might be successful. We do not have failing school districts anywhere in the state. We have excellent schools, and that is well-proven fact. And so there is absolutely no reason to be putting money into private sector realms. So, no and resend. Thank you. Thank you. The use of local authority to supplement K-12 public education revenues through local property taxes raises a statewide question of fairness and equity. Some Shawnee Mission constituents want to remove the cap on the local option budget. Others argue no cap is constitutionally unfeasible and conflicts with the state's responsibility provide equitable access to quality education. How do you think Kansas can reconcile these two positions? Again, this is a very large, uh, daunting question. And the answer probably varies without the people in this room. Uh, but what's most important is that we reflect what's most important to our, to our district, the people of our district. Um, when I was on the Roland Park City Council, we also faced some daunting challenges. We had, uh, we were in smack in the middle of the Great Recession. 
and we had some other monetary spending issues of our own. Um, and we had a Walmart leaving, which was 20% of our tax base. And it would have been a lot easier to solve those solutions um, if we would have closed the doors to the public and, and had what we think are the most uh, um, educated people or thoughtful people uh, in the room and just made the decision. And I see that that's what's going on with our Shawnee Mission School Board right now when we're trying to come up with a new finance formula um, to pay for schools. But what works and what Roland Park, <coughs> and Roland Park uh, actually were recognized with, um, uh, recognized with an award for was our ability to go to all of the stakeholders within the community, listen to all uh, points of view, and make and have encourage the public to have ownership of this issue, and then bring that solution to the table. This is not a legislator issue; it's not an elected official issue, uh, and. When we, can, when we have multiple uh, viewpoints and multiple stakeholders who felt that they've been heard, uh, we come to the most strongest decisions. Thank you. I'm moving to State Board of Education. I think this is what I'm going to do for you two, since there are a couple of questions that are more specific for you. I'll have you answer both the same question and we go through. There's two questions for you both answer two similar questions, if that's fine. It's okay. Making a call on the fly. Right. Uh, first question. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding the role of teacher licensure and preparation programs for K-12 education? Shall I take that? Yeah, you'll, we'll have both of you answer that same question first. There's a lot we do that's based on a lie. And the lie is you have to go to teacher's college or else there's nothing of any value you could give any of our children in any academic setting. So when I got to the board, I tried to state that piece of counsel to my fellow board members. And they weren't really hearing it. So I went to the legislature, and they helped us with the STEM license that the board approved on January 3rd, 2014. So now if you have a degree in science, technology, engineering, or math, biology, physics, chemistry, you can actually be welcomed into a high school. Now, how this affects us in Johnson County is not very much, because as our commissioner uh, Dr. Watson says, Johnson County is a destination for teachers. <coughs> but we have a lot of schools around the state that cannot get somebody to teach physics who knows physics. It's not a problem here at Shawnee Mission East. We need a physics teacher, we'll find somebody who knows physics, enjoys it, lives it, breathes it, communicates it to <coughs> adolescents very effectively. Around the state, they're hard to find. That is the teacher shortage. So. Do you have to go to teacher's college to be a teacher? Not in every case. Now let me follow that with, our colleges of education have a very important role to play in the preparation of early primary, primary, intermediate instructors. They have a huge role to play in the preparation of special ed teachers, which we give away waivers like candy, and the preparation of our future principals and superintendents. There's plenty of work for our colleges of education without keeping a lock on the secondary classroom door of a technical subject. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, same question, what are your thoughts regarding the role of teacher licensure and preparation programs for K-12 education? I understand how we got to where we are with the teacher shortage. I think there's been some value with Project Lead the Way and with STEM licensure. That being said, I think that hiring unlicensed teachers and people who are not qualified to go into a classroom is a short-term solution for a problem that is going to take years to remedy. Teachers have so many things that they need to understand going into a classroom, behavior management, understanding IEPs, diversity in population, test scores, being able to program and differentiate curriculum, parent conferencing, there are so many strategies that I learned through my teacher education program. I think we need to invest in quality programs that are recruiting teachers. We need to start valuing the profession, restore due process rights. If we can retain te the quality teachers that we have, most of our teachers are leaving after five years of experience. That is not okay. So we're losing really 
good people to the profession. It is a hiring unlicensed teachers as a short term solution to a long term problem. They all right, we will now go back down the line, so we'll begin with State Board of Education for a second round of questions. Uh, before we do that, let's lay the foundation for the uh, second segment, which will be your questions. If you would like to ask questions of any particular uh, individual or race, um, you can uh, write those questions down on post-it notes, yeah, yeah. index cards. So we are passing out index cards as I speak. <coughs> Um, again, it does not have to be directed towards a particular race or a candidate. It can just be um, a general question that has not been asked yet. Um, please write those down and hand those to Devin or Mary, or come, just walk, just get up and walk right over here and, and give those to her. Um, the more questions we have, uh, the better, more productive, and more illustrative that second part will be, which will begin um, after we go down the line again and also give them a chance to, to do their responses. So any question you have, of course, education-related, um, go ahead and write those down. You don't have to write your name. You don't have to identify yourself. You can if you want. Um, and then we will collect those, and that will be the second part. Let's go back down the line again. Um, randomly selected questions. Um, of course, not for the State Board of Education, since you have some very special questions. Um, this next question for both of you, you'll answer the, both of this. Uh, both of you will answer this question. It requires a little bit of of background. So this is a quote from the new Kansas Can Vision for K-12 Public Education. Kansas leads the world in the success of each student, and a successful Kansas high school graduate is defined as having the academic preparation, cognitive preparation, technical skills, employability skills, and civic engagement to be successful in post-secondary education in the attainment of an industry-recognized certification or in the workforce without the need for remediation. Got that? You memorized it, okay. Uh, so for both of you, what are your recommendations for measuring this Kansas CAN vision or these indicators of student success? And how much would you recommend state legislators allocate in the state budget to pay for these assessments? As we transition from um, AYP and the No Child Left Behind, and head into Every Student Succeeds Act, there are some pretty clear guidelines for measuring and accountability. Now, ESSA does give the states more flexibility with um, measuring and with accountability, but they have preserved some of the requirements for, for measuring progress and success, and they are, again, holding to measuring success of students based on race, ethnicity, income, and learning needs. There is less assessment than there has been in the past based on you no know, child left behind. However, there are still some guidelines about making sure that uh, African American children in third grade are making good progress in reading. There, there is a lot of flexibility. There is also assessment regarding student involvement with um, staff, so faculty engagement, student um, uh, school environment. They're, uh, they're in progress, I think, how to assess those different areas, social and emotional standards, are, are currently in progress. I would love to be part of a figuring out how to assess that. I don't know how much money is involved in making that kind, those kinds of assessments and, and the accountability. It, it will be less than we have had with the constant uh, statewide assessments. However, there's some good accountability that is already in place as we transition to the Every Student Succeeds Act. So I think it's an exciting time. Thank you, Chris Sendrick. Uh, Steve Roberts, same question for you. What are your recommendations for measuring uh, the Kansas CAN indicators of student success that I just read, and how much would you recommend that the legislature allocate in the state education budget to pay for such assessments? When we were talking about whether or not we should use the ACT st test statewide, um, there was a lot of talk about how much it would cost, and it's really not that expensive, in my view, given uh, all, the, all the money that we're spending on schools. I would favor the ACT, actually, statewide, but that's that's got to be hashed out with the with the numbers. Um, you know, we we don't have to worry so much about the fuss over money as the academic standards. And so, in seeing how all the pieces fit together, my recommendation would be that we have uh, stronger standards earlier. And as we work on new math standards, uh, a 
group that I've been working with envisions that we actually put kindergarten and first grade together so that when a kindergartner comes in with first, first grade math skills, uh, after your kindergarten, they go on to second grade, just as naturally as, as can be. This happens more often in Johnson County than it happens elsewhere around the state. We do have failing schools in Kansas. I'm hearing a lot of, uh, of talk today about how our schools are really terrific and we need to keep them that way, and that's how it is right here. But Chris and I are not running for the local board, we're running for the state board. And I'll just tell you that the superintendent who hired me at the Kickapoo School last year said, our kids have had lousy teachers for the last eight years before I was hired last year. Now, you could argue that that's a federal school and not a state school. We could have that argument. But we need to see how the pieces fit together longitudinally. So all these fixes we want for high school, it really starts when the kids are little. We need to do a better job with early primary. That's where the fixes lie. Thank you, Steve Roberts. Moving on to Senate District uh, 7, uh, Megan England, your question. What is the role of adequacy and equity in the finance of public education? Just in an effort to try to move things along and hear from you guys, um, adequacy is basically so that we can ensure that all, stu oh, that all students have a quality education nationally even um, recognize education and equity means that we can expect to receive that education across the state so uh, we need to make sure that those constitutional obligations are maintained respected and funded thank you barbara boyer the Kansas Supreme Court recently heard testimony in final preparation for a ruling on the adequacy portion of the Gannon lawsuit regarding the school finance and public education. Do you believe the K-12 public schools are adequately funded? Why or why not? I keep getting these yes and no questions. <laughs> First of all, I spent the morning listening. Uh, one of the brilliant things that we have from the state Supreme Court side is that we can actually watch online when they have uh, hearings. Uh, and so I was able to watch from the privacy of my own home and still do some other work and get that uh, accomplished. Uh, unlike what we do in the legislature, which is a transparency issue, we'll have another time of discussion about that. We, I, I agreed with their statements and I'm losing track of what I was supposed to be saying here <laughs> because the answer was yes and we need to move forward and have them fund appropriately our schools and I felt like their discussion was uh, it, it focused specifically on uh, maintaining what we have now for adequacy and then it suggested uh, the court was suggesting that we maybe focus very individually on the issue of students who are not performing at their highest level and I think that will be an interesting thing for us to discuss in the funding formula whether we have funding across the board that is increased or whether we only specifically address the issue of students who are in the lower third of accomplishment in our, in our districts and need to have uh, money directed specifically for them. So, Thank you. To House District 19, Stephanie Clayton. Funding for Kansas public schools has been characterized as flat, up, and down. In your opinion, which is it and why? I believe that funding in Kansas public schools is down, and you will hear many different arguments that have been posed regarding school funding. Uh, I am here to tell you that if I uh, messed around with my books at home, I could tell you that my own household incoming income was flat up or down. You, from the people who say that school funding has gone up, this is because of recent changes in accounting procedure that have now added teacher retirement into that funding. And so one of the problems is, is that you all as citizens 
have a lot of conflicting information that you receive. It is very difficult and very frustrating to have to make decisions when you're not often being told the truth and given the truth of the numbers. I do believe that school funding has gone down significantly. I think that this is part of the main problem with the 2012 tax plan because what should have been done at that time was that Kansas should have been fulfilling its constitutional obligation to fully fund schools and instead what happened was this crazy experiment um, that has gone terribly, terribly wrong and has plunged us into financial despair. I believe that by putting forth a reasonable, sustainable tax solution, that schools will be properly funded again, and that we will be able to fulfill our constitutional obligation that we are promised that we make to the people that we will have a strongly functioning government. And again, to continue with the optimism theme, we are going to do it, and it is going to happen, and I'm very excited about what is to come. Thank you. Liz Meidel. In your role as a state legislator, please describe what an effective working relationship looks like with the Shawnee Mission School District and what you can do to best represent the district, the interests of this district and its students. Well, if I may, I'm going to give a shout out to the person I'm running against because she does a really good job of this. Creating a really high quality relationship between the Shawnee Mission School District and the legislative body and the Kansas Association of School Boards and the Kansas Department of Education, because these are really all the players, means communicating both what the priorities are here in Shawnee Mission and our belief that it is important to take care of all of the students of Kansas. You can't just take care of Shawnee Mission School District, right? So if if we are to create a high quality working relationship, we have to represent both our needs well and the needs of the entire state because our children are growing up in concert with the children in the rest of the state. So to create a really high quality working relationship, what you would do is, this is similar to my question before, you would engage your stakeholders and have the conversations in a regular fashion so that they knew that it was an open door of communication. And then you take those messages back to the legislature and you share those and you create a culture of reciprocity in terms of I'm going to share with you, my community, what is happening in Topeka and I'm going to share with the people in Topeka what is happening in my community in a responsible way that shows that we are, and I'm going to go back to this one more time, extremely engaged with our local stakeholders but also cognizant of our role and responsibility as part of a larger state because those responsibilities have to be kept in balance. And um, I think that that's the role of all the legislators, not just the people who represent Shawnee Mission School District. Thank you. John Tobby. How would you characterize the impact of 2012 tax policy on public education in Kansas and Shawnee Mission Public Schools in particular. Thank you. First, thank you for saying my name correctly. That's been a problem since elementary school, almost. Um, I would like to start by saying that, uh, yeah, the trickle-down economics is a theory that our legislators should do their research. It does not work. I recently had a toe surgery, and my podiatrist was telling me that the tax cuts basically gave him a lot more money than he needed, but that it created no opportunity, zero opportunity to increase his business or hire more people. And so he was just left with more money, which he says he's grateful for. However, he already was not struggling to pay for his bills and pay for the things that he likes to do. We need tax policies that help common people, that uh, allow common people to not just get jobs, but we need common people to create jobs um, I'm going to get a little off track, but I need to mention this. In the CAN vision, it says that we need to, our students need to have the employability skills, but I, I think that that is actually a little bit overrated. I think that our students should have the job creating skills to come out into the world because creating a job for yourself is much more uh, better for your local economy and it's much more better for your own pocket. Take anybody that does a trade, take away the company that they do it for, and if they do it for themselves, they're going to pocket a lot more money than if they do it for a large company. 
I think we should be focusing on job creating skills. But to go back to the tax plan, legislature has had a couple chances to repeal those tax cuts since 2012. And I just think we should be making every opportunity to take those away because uh, we have the numbers. We know that it's the top few thousand people in Kansas that are benefiting from this. And the rest of us are now concerned, like I'm a common person with not a lot of extra pocket money. And now I have to be concerned about my, my child's education with special needs. And it's, it's very daunting. So I think we need to unleash our Kansas economy. We can correct legislation that can really redirect dollars back into education. And we don't have to do anything else other than that. Thank you so much. Thank you. To House District 21, Jerry Stocksville. Kansas has faced a budget shortfall following implementation of the 2012 tax policy, approaching 15% of the state general fund. Would you characterize this gap as a revenue problem or a spending problem? It's definitely a revenue problem. And why? Uh, well, I think that the, that the uh, 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 economic development policies of the Brownback administration, and again, uh, uh, those of him who, uh, those in the legislature support him, uh, just do not get the, uh, the uh, uh, idea that, that we have to uh, have a fair and balanced and uh, uh, widespread tax policy across the state. Uh, we took 330,000 uh, companies off the tax rolls. Uh, we were promised 100,000 new jobs uh, by doing that and that we would have a vibrant state economy. Uh, since that uh, policy has happened, uh, the Kansas economy is basically in shambles, and uh, we have to we have to put those companies back on the rolls. We have to develop a more fair and balanced tax structure across the state in order to support public education. Uh, with, and that's one of the things that we haven't talked about this morning. Uh, the, the great public schools in this state will rely on a robust economy, and you can't separate the two. If we don't address the economic uh, problems in Kansas, we can never address the educational problems in Kansas. And I know from that from a fact, uh, for uh, several years after I left uh, education, I was president of the Silicon Prairie Technology Association, which was the trade association for the high-tech industries in Kansas and Missouri. And I'll tell you, economically across the state, we are doing everything exactly opposite of what we need to do in order to attract those kinds of companies and that kind of build that kind of economy in the state of Kansas. We've got to correct that, we've got to put those companies back on the tax rolls, and we've got to develop a fair and balanced tax system across the state. Thank you. Dorothy Hughes, over the past five years, the Kansas legislature has challenged the constitutional authority of the judicial branch of government, the State Board of Education, and local municipalities. Do you agree or disagree with this statement and provide an example as it pertains to public education? I agree that they have challenged uh, the, the role of the courts and I disagree with them doing so. I think it's very important uh, that each branch of government does its job. We have three branches for a reason and they are the checks and balances on one another. I think it's very inappropriate for um, the legislature to um, fight against you know, rulings and say, well, we don't want to comply, you know, we want to do our own thing, and, you know, the courts are um, trying to do our jobs for us. That's, that's not productive. You know, the three branches work in concert, they all have a role, and whatever the decision is that comes down on adequacy in the next few months, it's incumbent upon you know, us who go to Topeka to comply with that ruling and find <laughs> Uh, the productive, collaborative way to move forward. Um, I know we've moved a little bit off of tax.